I feel the liftoff. The clock has started. Roger. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Punk Rocker Moon Stomper podcast. Uh, I am Amy Shira Title with you as always and of course uh, my co-host is Mr. I'm Jason McClellan <laughs> and Amy, why don't you introduce our guest today? I am super excited to have our guest today, uh, Mr. Derek Gibbs. Um, I think we should just let you introduce yourself, what you do and why we want you on a nerd podcast. Well, let's see. What I do is play bass in the band Real Big Fish, and why you want me here, I have no no idea. Um, cause I believe you typically tour with a telescope on a bus, don't you? Oh, I've been trying to do yeah. that lately. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, That's you're you're epic. a secret astronomy nerd, which is why I'm super excited to chat with you about like all things space. And all that weirdness, because like that's not what you'd expect, the two things to go together, and that's what this weird podcast is all about. Um, but as per usual, before we get into the nerdery, uh, we all need to start drinking, because this is way more fun when you're half drunk. Um, so I'm going to go with the not massive bottle that I have today. Um, I have the new Belgium Citradelic, because that's a thing that sounded really good. That is um, good so I'm going to... It is pretty good, eh? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and give you the soundbite of me cracking this on the microphone. Kind of. <laughs> kind of. Uh, Derek, what are you drinking today? It's in the kitchen. Can I go get it? Go, go get, get it. it. <laughs> go get it. Oh, and I want to see your shirt afterwards, too. <laughs> I can't believe you actually have a non-big beer. Way to go. I know. Well, the other one I have is like a massive beer. It's pretty the massive. The Acoustic Ales, Strawberry yeah. Fields, which like this sounded really, really good, but I don't know that I necessarily feel like drinking pint and a half right now maybe okay. for a longer show <laughs> maybe yeah I figured, maybe i figured i'd start big today all right this oh nice the, the latest from the enjoy by series from stone Such a awesome. beer. yeah excellent now i feel like i should have opened the bigger beer <laughs> yeah i know you're right glass. fantastic Nice, nicely done. No, no, the, no shame, uh, Amy. You should never, never, never feel dissuaded from from going big. I mean, I can. It's sitting on my desk, so I can always do it. But I feel like I should show this off. I've got my uh, vintage Apollo Twelve glass today. There you go. Um, nice. In in honor of nerdery and also my cat, who's named Pete Conrad. Uh, Jason, what are you drinking today? Well, you know, uh, for people who have listened to the show before, they may have already figured this out. And for for new people, you'll you'll learn this very quickly. But we're time travelers on this show. And uh, although you're probably listening to this in the month of February or so, it's actually Festivus today. So, you know, I decided that I would go with something festive. So I'm going with a, a, a Sam Adams Old Fezziwig Ale. Now, this thing, uh, it's a pretty good beer. It's ale brewed with cinnamon, ginger, and orange peel. So nice and festive. Sounds awesome. thought it was good for today. So. Yeah. Excellent. Also, Festivus. Yeah. Who do you think would win the feats of strength? <laughs> Out of the three of us? Yeah. Uh, you would? <laughs> I'm the short one, but I have been fighting a lot lately. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you post videos of, of you kicking stuff. I'm, I'm not getting involved with that. Yeah, I got hit in the head like five times yesterday really hard. My neck's actually quite sore, but it was good. <laughs> it was good. Anyways, cheers, guys. Cheers. Um, let's, uh, let's get started. I um. I'm not really good at preparing questions for guests. So that's the glory I don't know. of this show because there is no structure. We have mm -hmm. we go into episodes with a sort of loose theme, and uh, I guess today our, our loose theme is astronomy. But you know, music and, and other things play a, a key element in this show. So I guess Derek, I want to just jump off. I alluded to this uh, when we spoke earlier, but. Um, I think you and I have actually met, and this probably would have been 2003, 20, yeah, 2003, um, in Phoenix. Uh, I produced concerts for several years, and I brought um, Forces of Evil to town. Mm. Um, and that was at the Brick House, I think, a venue that doesn't exist anymore. But uh, yeah, Forces of Evil show in, in Phoenix. Not was that, that one where we, we played downstairs? Is that no. a place called? 
No? Okay, good. No. That was <laughs> okay, <deep>. good. <laughs> I thought I was going to... If I thought if, if there was a fire, I definitely would have died at that show. So I yeah, think there was only one way out. That would have been at the Nile, I think. <sighs> okay. Yeah, that, it, really small. Um, a, lot of, a lot of punk shows and stuff happened there down in this basement. It, it had a, a larger upstairs... Um, you know, and it was a smallish, mid-sized venue where the, you know, around thousand to, to 1500, um, shows would play, but the smaller shows would play down in the basement and this place, it was just an absolute death trap and it eventually got shut down pretty much, but I was scared. Because when it I was, was a death trap? There. No, uh, for whatever reason, venues closed down and that's usually one of them, but, uh, no, mm -hmm. it, it changed ownerships and then became a church and became a something else. And it's, <laughs> it's a venue again, it's back in the hands of uh, people who were going to shows and promoting shows back then. So yeah, good times. Cause you, you definitely think of death trap punk venues as turning into churches. That's like the natural progression in my mind. I like that. I like that. Thanks Phoenix. <laughs> that's a um, 2000. Wait, what'd you say? Three. No, mm, that's a mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. 2003. So yeah, back, yeah, back even... forces of evil days. Um, yeah. That oh, was a while ago. I can't, man. Music history kind of flies by. Yeah, and you've been you've been doing this for ages. You've been like working in this realm for ages. Yeah, both so of you. To remember a one day out of the last <laughs> ten. Yeah, plus, no, I, I knew there was no chance. I'm not the best at it. Yeah. <laughs> well, That's and totally you know how fair. it goes at, at shows. I mean, people come up to you. They're all, hey. I, I saw you so and so at this venue so many years ago, and you're all, oh yeah, I remember. Just do a Not smile a and nod and yep. like make smile their day nod. a little bit. And you're just yep. like, I have no I idea. I guess it can depend on the situation. I try not to pretend and be phony yeah. because I feel like people can see right through that when it comes to me. So I'll say, hey, we probably did meet, but if it was a year or two ago, sorry, man, I don't remember. <laughs> yep. Even if it was a week ago, I sometimes I don't remember. <laughs> Fair. That's fair. Um, I would really like to know what's on your shirt, Derek. Oh. It looks my first, spacey. My first day wearing this, I just re, uh, That's awesome. renewed That's my exciting. membership to the Planetary Society, and I got a new shirt. Nice. That's rad. Nice. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's not a bad one, too. Planetary Society, which is like five blocks that away from my house. Hmm. I walk by them all the time, and I've never gone in there. Nice. All right, cool. Nice. Appropriate. I, I thought so. I have a membership card here somewhere, but I feel like they need to send me another one. And I don't think it, I just got the shirt. I, is that the only space related society you belong to? Oh, uh, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I subscribe to a couple of magazines, but I don't think that counts. Yeah. So I'm curious to Amy's question. What, what do you get with that membership? I get a quarterly, um, I wouldn't even call it a magazine. It's kind of a report on yep. what they're doing with the money that they raise. I get, well, this time I got a shirt. Um, Sweet. Membership shirt. card, although I don't know what that does other than I can show it to you and say I'm a member. I, I don't get discounts anywhere. Or I don't get to go to JPL whenever I want. Uh, have you Have you ever been to JPL? Yeah. In fact, I went this year to the open house they had in the springtime. Uh, and that was the Isn't first Isn't it the worst? The open you know, house is like the worst day to do JPL. I went two years ago with a producer I was working with and like I, I offered to take her because I'd been there enough to like tell her the things and not wait in line. It was like it's like Disneyland without the rides. Like okay. we waited three <laughs> hours to look at the high bay, but there was nothing in the high bay. It was like, why are people so excited about a big, empty, clean room? <laughs> and yeah, that's a good point. But yeah. Uh, they tried something new this year that I think may have solved your issue with how crowded it was. They did an online, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a lottery, but you had to sign up and they had a, a limited amount of tickets and you had to tell them what time you were going to be there. So they tried to control the attendance throughout the weekend. Okay. And, you know, I still had to wait almost an hour for like to go to the control room with all the screens and stuff. Yeah. But I don't think it was as bad as what you remember from a couple years yeah, ago. Yeah, that's good. But I also don't have a comparison because the last time I went to an open house there, I was probably 11 years old. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a while. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's uh, I've been there. Like I've got a bunch of friends 
out there because like I live here. Um, yeah, it's a lot nicer when you can go and just like hang out with people that you know that can take you to places. So yeah, if you ever need a better tour, I can probably put you in touch with the right people so you don't have to wait in line for five hours and you can actually like, I don't know, when they s- send us through, I think I think the, the control room is the, the center of the universe, as they call it, the, the, yes. the heart of the DSN, which yeah. is like, it looks so cool. If anybody out there has been there, you know what I'm talking about, because it's all like blue lit from the floor up. So it looks like a movie movie set. And like they did that because they know that this stuff looks great on TV. But at the open house, they sort of like like let you, it was like soup Nazi style of like shuffle sideways. Do not talk to anybody who is working and you don't get to do anything. And then they, of course, had the the cardboard cutout of Bobek, the Mohawk guy. Um, it's just like this is a very weird way to like show people JPL. But yeah, yeah it's more fun when you get to like hang out in there for a while because like there's really cool shit going down. Hmm. Um, so, yeah. So you went to your first JPL open house when you were 11. So are you like a longtime space nerd? Where did your space nerdery come from? I guess my dad got me started because he was a member of the Planetary Society. He got Astronomy Magazine. Uh, he would have me watch the original Cosmos you know, on whatever PBS station it was out here at the time, 28 or 50, KCET, I think, or KOC. And he would take me to planetarium shows at, well, wherever you could find them, usually at a local university or college. And... Uh, he eventually bought a, a telescope for the family, a, a small, at least I call it small, Celestron. Uh, let's see, like a classic, what do you call it, a C, C80 or something like that. I think the 80s, 80, 80 millimeter, so not very big. And uh, Pretty big, yeah. yeah. Big enough to go, ooh, ah, look at the moon and look at yeah. Mars. And, and uh, it, then that kind of subsided for a while. And... As I got older, I thought, all right, I want to invest in a really good one. And I want to start taking pictures through it. Nice. I was going to ask you that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So first thing I did, uh, this is turning into a long story, but I guess that's what it No, no, go for that's it. That's yep. why, <laughs> this is exactly why we wanted to talk to you about the space nerdery stuff. Just go for it. Let's get the and whole you know, story. You, you, you've got a big beer, so you're good. Yeah. Good time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Cheers. Cheers. So I bought a big camera, a DSLR, a Canon 60D. Of course, right before they came out with the astrophotography version, yeah. but whatever. Mm-hmm. And before I bought my own telescope, I borrowed that that earlier one I was talking about from my dad for a while. And I got some pretty good results with it, but it, it's not computerized. It's not tracking. You know, It's got a couple knobs to uh, adjust it, and you do it manually as you go. So I was just taking pictures of the moon, but they came out really nice. And I, I think I used it for some solar stuff too, like uh, the Venus transit that was oh, wow. yeah. two or three That's years awesome. ago. I mean, I, I could probably draw it in a paint program and it would look the same as my photo. You know, it's, <laughs> it's a background with a disc and a little ball like this. Mm-hmm. That's, hey, that's Venus. Sure it is. Yeah. Yep. Transit of Venus is awesome, but it's one of those things that, like if you don't know what you're looking at, it really does look like you just hit like put a black dot on a picture yeah. of the sun in Photoshop. Like sure. it's super cool, but it's really hard to like tell people why it's cool. But yeah. so anyways, continue. You're taking pictures of the transit of Venus. Yeah. And uh, that was one of the last things I did with that telescope. And then I finally invested in my own. So I got a big uh Celestron C11, so it's an 11 inch. I'm holding my hands up like people can see that on the podcast. Uh, Schmidt Castle. There's a video version. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's true. And that's where I'm at now. That's not the one I bring on tour though, because it's ridiculously uh, big, and especially when I have it in a case and stuff to try and keep it safe. And there's no way it would survive tour. It would. The, the mirrors would get all upset, and it would be a pain in the ass. Are you doing astrophotography with that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so the one I have that I take on tour lately, like at first I bought a really cheap one that came in a little backpack, very plasticky, and oh, my binoculars are better than this telescope. <laughs> so I handed that one down to my three-year-old nephew so he can trash on it. And I, uh, for, for this warp tour we did this past summer, I bought a, uh, is it an Orion, I think? Yeah, Orion. But it's still... Like, it's tabletop. It doesn't have a tripod. 
but it has motors in it, so you can roughly line it up with north, and it'll try to track a little bit. And it's got a, a hand controller that you can aim it if you want. Or, I'm sorry, no hand controller. It's just got buttons on it, so you can motorize, use the motors to aim it a little bit. But it gets a pretty good picture, and it was enough to where people would walk by. I, I don't know how many, if either of you have been to the Warp Tour and been back where all the buses are and all the bands hang out when it's all over. Yeah. And it's kind of a a big... Community. Yeah, community. Maybe like summer camp for band dudes and girls. Uh, so after hours, people are milling around and going on each other's buses and playing games and cornhole and cooking and all that. And I set up a table with the telescope. And I made a lot of friends that would come by and is that a telescope and you would maybe you guys would believe this but i didn't believe how many people have never even looked through one yeah and it it made me a little sad and it also made me feel like wow am i some kind of warp tour astronomy ambassador now like right maybe these people are gonna yeah. go oh i want to go home and buy one of those and and i i would say do you want to see the rings of saturn uh yeah you can do that yeah, it's right there. And they go, how do you know it's right there? And I, I scratch my head. I, I guess I just have paid attention and read. Now I know. So that's awesome to hear about, you know, getting that uh, attention and causing people to be become interested. But uh, have you also made friends who have, have previously had similar interests and might actually have, uh, you know, done some astronomy themselves? <sighs> You know, not that I can really recall. Really? Uh, uh, one of the guys in the band, his brother, bought a telescope a little bit after I did. And he's much more serious about photography and mm. gets really good results. Like He, he really does the legwork and drives out to the, the middle of, like near the Salton Sea. Uh, what's that? Anza Borrego, the park. And it's super dark. Mm. And he gets some really awesome photos that makes me kind of go, ah, damn it, I need to... I need to do that too, but uh, other people really into astronomy. I mean, friends around me will take an interest in it and, oh, what are you looking at? Oh, that's cool. Hmm. But I don't think I know anyone. It, no big space nerds, huh? Yeah. I, wow. If I'm forgetting someone, it's going to be really embarrassing <laughs> when they go, hey, dude, why didn't you remember me? But, like, learning how to use a telescope and, like, learning how to do astrophotography, like, that's a commitment in itself. Yeah. So I, I was once gifted a very cheap, probably plastic telescope for Christmas that, like, yeah, I, similar to you, like, my binoculars were better. I couldn't figure out even how to use the stupid thing, and I gave it away at, like, a secret Santa thing a couple of years ago. And <laughs> I'm pretty sure it just keeps making the round within my space friends because everyone's like, oh, a telescope. And then they're like, the next year, yeah, this is a really shitty telescope. Um, yeah, it's like for people who aren't super committed to like learning how to track things in the sky, it's like, what do I do with this tube? Yeah. It, this, and this big telescope Tough. I bought, it, uh, it changed my world because it's so automated. Yeah. I, mean, I, I kind of feel like I'm cheating, but who cares? Because it's, I can just say, I want to see this. Whee! And it, it, if, if I've set it up reasonably well, it's pretty much yeah. in the frame. And I go, wow, that, that's right there. Like I could have seen that with my dad's old telescope, but it would have taken me a lot more know-how and looking at a chart and being really patient, like just to find it. Like I know easy where the Andromeda galaxy is if it's the right time of year. Mm -hmm. I can boom, boom, boom. Okay, there it is. Binoculars. Yep, I see it. And with this other telescope I bought for Warp Tour, you know, it's not automated, and you can't just pick it up and aim it like binoculars. So I'm like trying to get it and, and it's much smaller uh, field of view. So it's not as forgiving as far as finding it. Oh, I was so hard. So having the computerized thing, I recommend that to everybody. That's awesome. And is this, is this the one too that like, because it's not computerized, do you have to manually track objects that you're looking at? Cause I well, feel like that's, how, like how much of that do you actually have to like even if you're looking at the moon i mean if you're looking at a certain spot you kind of have to like keep moving as the earth sure. is rotating otherwise like you're gonna lose it and that's Absolutely. what people never think about too is like you can't just point it and go because you know there are no fixed stars thanks aristotle um yeah the the like, little one that, that i take on the road it has a primitive ability if you set it up just right and it'll kind of keep it in frame 
somewhere between not having a motor at all or having a really good computerized telescope. Somewhere, like, you can you can step away and have someone else look and then come back to it, and it's still kind of in the frame. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. 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 Have you ever used any like insanely big telescopes, like at observatories, just playing around? Uh, you know, when I was a kid, my dad took me to, I think one one or two of the ones that are around here. What Mount Wilson and mm -hmm. Palomar? Is that the other mm -hmm. one that's kind of close? So. And I, I'm sure they let us look through, but I don't remember it being anything fantastic. And you know, even with those big. Uh, university-sized telescopes, if they're looking at a star, well, it's a point of light. Yeah. Especially when you're Again. a little kid. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you have to know what, why what you're looking at is cool to care about it. Otherwise, it's like, well, look, it's a dot. Yeah, yeah. Like, I got nothing. Yeah, that's true. Um, like the, the one got... in Griffith. I, I'm sorry, I keep interrupting. No, no, go ahead. The, the one in Griffith isn't really that big of a telescope. It looks pretty impressive, but I think you can do... Like the one I have at home, even though it doesn't look as impressive, it's not that far off. Especially again, if they're just pointing at like, oh, there's Sirius, and you, yeah, it looks the same in their telescope. It doesn't as it does in mine, I think. Yeah, how big but, is the telescope at Griffith? I have no idea. I, I don't know either. I, I used to know. Uh, it might be a couple feet in diameter. I, I shouldn't even say because I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not meant that's... for scientific ex observing, though. You know, that whole place was just built to get the public kind of into it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I spent uh, more than six years as a journalist focused on UFOs and extraterrestrial life. So I've got to ask you, as a, a sky watcher, have you ever seen any anything unidentified in the sky? Oh, uh, no. Nothing that made me think I was actually seeing uh, a UFO. Mm -hmm. from another planet uh, I've been in the desert and stuff and seen things go across the sky that you know usually you can tell if it's a satellite right pretty steady just boom sometimes you'd see things that change direction but living where we live you've got Edwards Air Force Base Nellis Air Force Base places where they're trying out stuff right and like if, if they're doing mid-air refueling or testing some cruise missile or whatever it's going to behave in ways that you're not used to seeing just living by LAX or, or Orange County Airport. So I, I would not claim that I've seen a UFO ever. How but, much is that the first question people ask you when they see you with the telescope? Yeah, I guess it came up a few times. Do you think, you know, this or this? Because I, I feel like even the most casual space person who's, like, not super involved but is, like, everyone has some, pe like, passing interest in it, the first thing they ask is always, like, what about aliens? Right. <laughs> it's always about aliens. Like, that's the first – it's, like, people don't know anything about what's really going on off the planet. But it's always, like, but what about aliens? That's real, right? It's, like, okay, let's continue on with your train of thought. Go on. <laughs> it's me. And then, yeah, it gets weird. It gets really fun. But, um, yeah. Everybody's I got an email the other day, actually. Yeah, but like, I don't know. I'm sure. I'm sure, Jason, you get all the crazies. I got an email the other day from somebody who is a private citizen trying to raise, oh my God, seven billion dollars to restore an alien structure that was destroyed by the pyramids. It was the most nonsensical email. It was pretty phenomenal. But he was uh -huh. asking for my help to get his cause out into the world, and I was like, I almost want to do it because it's really funny. <laughs> you know, those are the, uh, new, the yeah. new scam emails that are like the Nigerian prince you know, needing to shelter money or whatever. Right, right. Because now they're Nigerian aliens? Like, aliens. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, it's uh, the the creativity, like, I just gets me every time. But yeah, everyone's obsessed with aliens and, like, wants to know alien life. It's like, yep. ooh, telescope, that means you're looking at aliens on Mars. <laughs> uh, no, no. Well, and um, it's funny, too. I mean, just for, for UFO watchers, you know, and, and actively looking for UFOs, um, People, for some reason, think telescopes would be good for that. And uh, if you're looking for things zipping through the sky, a telescope's not, yeah. a, not your good tool for that. Yeah, try and get the International Space Station in a telescope. Yeah. People I mean, do it, but they get really lucky. That's hard enough to do uh, with a camera. but Yeah, yeah. 
you know, one of the coolest yeah, I things like... I saw was, uh, you know, and at the time, you know, it looked really weird and was pretty exciting. And people I was with, um, you know, were very excited because they thought they were with me when there was a, a UFO in the sky. Um, but the International Space Station was making a pass. But it was also during a time when the last space shuttle was getting ready to dock. So the ah. space shuttle was kind of trailing it as it was sure. going yeah. through the sky. So you saw these two nice. lights. It was really cool to see. Awesome. That is pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah, I'll I always love the pictures, too. And, oh, gosh, well, I'm good at talking at the same time as you. <laughs> no, it's good. It's, it, we'll blame it on the video delay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it's always, yeah. it's always the awkward of the Skype calls. Okay. Yeah, go. Uh, <laughs> I've seen satellites through my telescope, but I wasn't trying to. Hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll be looking at something, and then something will dart across my field of view. Like, whoa, what are the chances of that? And then you look at a map of how many things are that we put up there are orbiting the, pl the planet and you're like, okay, maybe it's not that big a deal that I see one every once in a while. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, it's sad how much we've littered space. There's so much space junk out there. It's actually a little bit amazing sometimes to me that we don't smash into things more. Yeah. Maybe it's that's like... a, a hint at, as to how immense space is and how even just in our little yeah. bubble that it, there's a lot of room out there. Yeah. Yeah, because well, even I think the, they're not that far away. Like, I think they're right. all within kind of that 200 or 300-mile three, radius. Like, my, yeah. It's not a lot of space, but, yeah, we can still go places without smashing them. But, like, all the bits and pieces of junk, like, panels that have broken off, like, there's a lot of shit out there. We should probably deal with that as a species. Well, there are companies <laughs> that are, you know, have that on their radar I know. and, and I know. are working on these machines that will go and gobble up the space junk, but... Yeah, I, I feel like a, they have as good a of chance of getting funding right now as the guy wanting to raise seven billion dollars to recover alien artifacts from the yeah, pyramid. And so. frankly, when you're yeah. you're, you're appealing awesome. to people who have an interest in space or anything going on in space, you know, whether it's it's good or bad, I, I think you have a better chance of getting people to give you money to land stuff on asteroids and mine asteroids than you do cleaning up garbage that's in space. So. Yeah, if people can't see what's in it for them, they're not super into it. Yep. And nobody really cares about cleaning things, case in point, our own planet. Um, so why would we clean things that are off our planet when we could go mine an asteroid and right. then gain wealth for a country so that we can fight about it? Yeah. <laughs> Humanity! Exactly right. yes. We're yeah. awesome. <laughs> Humanity for the win. <laughs> yeah. That. Go team. Yeah, cheers. Can you ask me if I track satellites? Mm. I was going to ask you if you um, if you kind of keep tabs on satellites, because I know some people like to try to track satellites and kind of have a rough idea of where they're going. I know a lot of photographers, well, I don't know personally photographers, but that try to, you know, take those perfect pictures of like the ISS going across the moon. And then you have this like perfect little outline. Um, do you ever track satellites or, or stations or anything just to like try to try to get those pictures? I've never tried to take a picture of the space station. And that's the only one that I would ever try to take a picture of. I do have an app on my phone that will let me know when the space station is going to be visible and for how long and how high and all that. Yeah. Uh, yep. Some of the software I use on the on the PC, either to control the telescope, which you can do that, by the way, or to just uh, find out where things are and then I'll go outside and hunt for it. Some of them actually have lists of um, satellites and you can enable that, and then on the computer screen, you'll see the dot, and it'll have the name of the satellite, and it'll let you know that it's where it's at. But then to go outside and try and find it through the telescope, no way. I'd rather just wait and let it happen by accident and yeah. you know, have this surprise. Yeah, I can imagine that trying to track a very fast-moving dot against the sky is like kind of annoying and not the most exciting thing you could do with a scope in a backyard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is fun, though, to have the app and to say to people, oh, hey, look out the window in 10 seconds and there's going to be the space station. What? How do you know that? And then, boom, there it is. <laughs> well, that's just an airplane. No, it isn't. Look at it. Whoa. Yeah. I like <laughs> that you put on the bro voice for the like, no, how do you know that? Because like, that's exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If ever I'm out, I'm like, hey, look, it's Venus. How do you know that? Uh, it's just a thing that I know. <laughs> it's uh, the easy one to pick out. Yeah, uh, this probably isn't nice of me to, to bring up, but I won't use anyone's names. I, I, I met someone once that we got in the conversation of 
like planetary observing and I'm like, oh yeah, this is a good time. You can see Venus and Jupiter and I think that's Saturn. Whoa, is this like a like a, a special event or like is tonight the night? I'm like, no, they they're just moving around. Sometimes you can see them, sometimes you can't. He goes, Wow. Next thing you're gonna tell me is that you can hold your phone up to the sky and it'll tell you what everything is. <laughs> and I went, Yeah, you mean this? And I did it for him and he's you know Yep. He thought I was a yep. wizard. Even though I didn't What's yeah. What's your app of choice for that? Uh, I think it's just Google Sky. Google Sky. Have you ever tried cool. Sky Guide? <sighs> Sky Guide. Sky Guide is my favorite because it does, you can actually select the wavelength to look at the sky in. So you can do ultraviolet, infrared, um, x ray, visible, and there's one other one that I can't remember off the top of my head. UV, maybe, if I didn't say that. So you can just, like, like select what you want to do, and then you can zoom into all these things, and it, like, uses Hubble data to, like, put together what all of these features look like. It's hmm. awesome. You can look at it in all these wavelengths, and it, like, tracks planets, and you can do it so that it's just, like, by compass, and you can track planets. That way you can look through the Earth, or you can just, like, manually go. It's awesome. What's it called again? Sky Guide. Sky Guide. I'm right. Sky Guide. Yeah, it's I, I uh, completely unsponsored. I would highly recommend it. It's my favorite like nerd app to pull out and just be like, yep, that's what that is. That's what that is. Here's the moon coming up right here, and you can see all the things. It's, it's awesome. It's I'm a really good one. That. Yeah, I just love the different wavelengths of light too, because it's so cool to see stuff that you can't see. Right. And like nobody thinks about why you would care or want to look in different wavelengths. Do you use any filters on your scopes to do different wavelengths imaging or just looking? I, do you I have, have to some, physically put that on, or can you do it with computers? I don't know how that works. Uh, I have a set of filters. They came with a little kit I got that had some cheap eyepieces and filters. And they actually, if you if you mess with a telescope, the eyepiece, oh, you can't see my fingers, it, It's uh, there's the end you look in. And then on the other end, most of them are usually threaded on the inside. And all these filters, it's all a standard. And uh, the filter just screws into the bottom of the eyepiece. And then you put it in the telescope. And I've tried because they say, oh, if you use this one, you can see this planet better or this galaxy better. And I mean, most of the stuff I'm doing out of my backyard. So I'm dealing with one of the most light polluted areas on the planet. And so by the time I would get to the point where a filter would really benefit me, in my opinion, I just don't mess with it. There's one for the moon, which is really good, because if you look at the full moon through a really good telescope, it's bright. It's blinding. Like you look away from the scope, and the, there's the moon wherever you look because it's burned in your eye for five minutes. Mm -hmm. So there is a moon filter, which is essentially sunglasses for your telescope. Mm -hmm. nice. It just it just dims it and it makes it more comfortable to look at. Yeah, that's kind of awesome. Yeah, people never. I actually had this conversation at dinner last night trying to explain to a friend of mine that moonlight is actually significantly bright enough that if you're in a dark area with a full moon, <laughs> that you can read by moonlight. And he yeah. didn't believe me. I was like, well, go out into the forest, which this kid would never do. Go out into the forest in a full moon alone with nothing. And, like, bring a large print book for old people. And you'll be able to read it by moonlight. Yeah, that destroys all kinds of, of astronomy things. But as a moon person, I love it. <laughs> yeah. We used to, uh, like, driving back and forth from Arizona to here, especially when I was a kid. You get out there when the, when the 40 was just a two-lane road. If I remember, I think that's the road. You can turn off the headlights if it's a full moon. And, you know, don't do this. It's dangerous. <laughs> Always drive at night with your headlights on. But <laughs> if you're crazy yeah. and for a second, you just turn the lights off and you can still see. Yeah, yeah. I was coming back from, uh, I forget where, somewhere like in the hills outside L.A. A cousin was visiting friends and I was driving back from their place and it was like 1.30 in the morning. There was no one around and it was a super full moon. And I was like, I'm just going to go real slow for half a second here. And I turned my headlights off and it was insane how bright it was. And I was like, okay, not dying, turning back on, but it was awesome. Yeah. yeah. And that was just for a split second. If you had given your eyes the, the what do they say, like 20 minutes or so to adjust. Yeah. You, well, that's would... why you got to drive with an eye patch, right? Oh. And then you switch it and then you, and then you have your night vision in that eye and then you can drive with the night vision eye and then... And then you also get the benefit of feeling like a pirate. <laughs> but I don't exactly. want to be a pirate. <laughs> I don't want to be a pirate. Uh, no, this is this is actually, that was a question that I got um, on my channel not too long ago. Somebody like came to a talk I gave and was like, why are there always pictures of astronauts wearing eye patches? And I'm like, space pirates. Uh, no, it was to preserve night vision for doing um, 
star sightings for guidance computers. Um, but yeah, so then I went through the history of like why Apollo astronauts always wear eye patches, and it was night vision. Huh. It's kind of neat. Yeah. yeah. It's real. Yeah, because you don't think about like how bright you know the sun is when you're outside of an atmosphere. That'll blind you. That'll destroy your ability to see. So yeah. <laughs> when I go to space, I'm taking an eye patch. <laughs> as as well you should also just in case you need like to pull a mutiny or something mm -hmm. you should be prepared <laughs> i'll be ready to hijack something for sure there you yeah. go there you go um yeah i had another question for you but i kind of lost it in the rant about eye patches all Jason, right well, anything? <laughs> yeah sure derek um just curious um looking at our solar system is there a particular uh, uh, favorite place you have looking at uh, celestial bodies in our solar system? Not necessarily that you can see with your telescope, but uh, favorite in general for whatever reason. In the solar system. Yep. I guess I have to include the telescope experience in there. Okay. Because that's part of it for me. Uh, it's got to be a toss-up between uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Okay. Maybe I should give it to Saturn because for a better part of my life, it was being able to see those rings through a telescope that was neat because yeah. it's such a unique sight from standing here, at least. Yeah. Uh, what, I mean, there's only so much you can really see that's in our sol just our solar system. If you uh, expanded it to maybe our galaxy then I might say Orion the Hunter is one of my favorites mm. as far as things to see. And that's just looking up. Like, I, it gives me a little comfort. Like, oh, there he is. Thanks, guy. Nice. <laughs> Orion is by far my favorite. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that when I was younger, that's really the only constellation I could ever see. <laughs> Like, it's so easy to find. I would look up and in my mind, I could make tons of Big Dippers. Like, well, there's the Big Dipper, there's the Big Dipper. You know, I could connect stars all over the place. But but Orion was always there. And, uh, you know, when I would, would be camping outside all the time in the, the desert and the outskirts of Phoenix, I would look up and, and he'd be my camping buddy. That yeah, was pretty awesome. Yeah. What about I, you, Amy? Favorite constellation? Uh, being from a city, I can't actually find or recognize what are stars? any. Yeah. Yeah, no. Uh, I could always recognize just Orion's belt. I still can't figure out where the rest of it is. Um, Even Beetlejuice? The... No. I got, I, nope. I was never, I was, I'm like really bad at constellations. Yeah. I can't recognize it. I don't really, I think uh, Cassiopeia I can usually pick out, but like, yeah, growing up, it was only at summer camp when we were on camping trips outside of camp that you could have a dark enough sky and we're like away enough from a city to, to see that. Cause like we were in Algonquin park and in, in Ontario where it's just like, there's nothing. You can't even have motorboats. So it's like silent and pitch black and it's amazing wow. stars. Um, but yeah, it was uh, like being out there and I, I didn't know anything at that time. So I was just like, Nope, just stars pretty. Um, yeah, and I tried. I had one night when I was in Australia this summer of, like, perfect pitch black, clear sky. It was absolutely freezing, and I realized that I don't know a single southern hemisphere constellation. Mm -hmm. It's really too bad. <laughs> well, the, last time, the last time I was there, which was probably a year, year and a half ago, I finally saw the Southern Cross hmm. with my own eyes. Yeah. And I, did I, try and, I don't think I have my camera with me to take a picture of it, but that's okay. Sometimes it's just best to observe and use your brain to take a photo. Yeah, so can the experience. Yep. Do you ever experience post? Do you ever do you ever publicly post any yeah. of your your astrophotography? I have an album on my Facebook. Cool. But you know, I pretty much use that to keep in touch with friends and family. Right. I haven't made it the the guy from Real Big Fish Facebook. No. <laughs> Maybe I should. Maybe you should, because then you'll get more people going. Oh wow. Space. That's cool. I make yeah. my Instagram public and just anyone can follow me. So as far as if there are fans following me, that's what they're going to do is go to my Instagram. I've posted a couple photos on there. Cool. But it, it, there's a little extra work involved because, you know, big camera, got to get it to the computer and then get it onto the phone. Yeah. Not right. super complicated, but just enough to where you go, eh, I'll do it later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
It's also yeah. losing like the joy of a good astrophotography image is like when it's big and you can see things and like Instagram is what yay big. It's sort of like, well, eh, it's barely obvious what I'm taking a picture of right now. Yeah, I feel Unless like I crop it. Sometimes yeah. it's perfect because I'll get this big picture and you might look at it and go, what am I looking at? And I'll go that fuzzy yeah. thing right there. Oh, yeah. crop out the fuzzy thing. <laughs> yeah, yep, you yep. got to do the pop outs and the, the captions for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i always i always find the the astronomy accounts that i follow on instagram sort of like this is kind of neat but i want it to be like 17 times bigger yeah it's unfortunate but i follow hmm. one or two people that do it and every time i see their pictures i go oh i'm not trying hard enough or <laughs> i need to spend more money on my gear you know so many of the stuff the photos you see in magazines and all that they have uh, guide scopes and they're it's another telescope piggybacking on your main scope, tracking space so that it can adjust the telescope perfectly to keep it dead center. And they're taking exposures that are, you know, half an hour or an hour. And they're, huh. they're using filters like you were saying, and they'll take photos and you'll see the caption underneath. It'll say it's an LRGB exposure. So they're doing a full light picture and they're taking one in green but when I say L, R, red, green, and blue, right? RGB, yeah. And then they'll combine so them all in Photoshop to get a, a RGB, color. Image. Yeah. So it'll say total mm -hmm. exposure time, four and a half hours. I'm like, what? I can barely take a photo for over 20 seconds and everything starts to smear a little bit. Right. Yeah. That was going to be my question to you is what is the longest exposure picture you can manage before it starts to become like just getting to be a blurry, fuzzy mass. Without getting too fancy hooking up my camera to a computer or something, the, the settings in the camera, I can set it for a maximum of 30 seconds, which is fine because if it's, if it's a, a nebula or something, if I get past 20, 25 seconds, I either get stars smearing or the, the orange street light glow starts creeping in right. to the, to, from the edges. Yeah. Huh. And the sky just looks orange. Right. Have you ever gone out into the desert somewhere to just to do astrophotography? Let's see. I took it to my parents' house in Arizona once, and it's much darker there. But I don't know. I, I wasn't having that much luck. But I had just gotten there from driving five hours. There was a, a thunderstorm on the way later. So we were kind of tired and rushed, and there were clouds coming in. So it wasn't a good uh, a good a good try. Uh, I have taken the scope up like into the mountains, like Lake Arrowhead, but I don't think I had my camera with me at that point. Mm. And it was really cold. So mm. your fingers start to go numb. And if you're not ready for it, or if someone in your group didn't bring the right jacket and they're dying mm -hmm. of uh, cold exposure, you got to pack it up and go. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely something this that uh, require, requires patience, and uh, a lot of people don't have patience for, for any, any type of sky watching. Not at all. And I enjoy, when I have the opportunity to do it, that it lets me exercise that kind of patience and just do, do that for a few hours. And uh, when I first got the setup going, I'd stay out until the sun came up sometimes and uh, just... I'd take a little nap and then look at all the photos I got and uh, I'd get really excited. But uh, this year it's kind of been tapering off. We've been on the road a lot. And when I've been home, I haven't been wanting to stay up really late for some reason. I guess I'm being more productive during the day. So it's making me tired doing, doing things around the house. And we've had a lot of cloudy nights, I feel like, this year when I've been home. Hmm. And like right now, if it's been raining on and off, it seems like for a week, week and a half. Not that we don't need it. Which we is all. awesome because we need it. We do. <laughs> It is great. Yeah, I don't. I don't have to water my plants for a long time, but uh, <laughs> it's not good for the, setting up the telescope. That's for sure. Yeah. So there is a point and shoot camera on the market that has caught my attention recently um, because I know some people who have it, and I've seen some of their the, the shots they get. But it's a, a one of the Nikon Coolpix cameras, and I think it's the P nine hundred. But this is a, a super, it's a fixed lens camera, but it's a super, super telephoto. And um, I think it's a 24 to 2000 millimeter or something. Um, but it's got an 83 times optical zoom. 
and Absolutely. part of their wow. part of their marketing That's campaign insane. is shoot the moon and you literally with this camera can hand hold a a shot shoot the moon and it's insane like anti shake whatever kind of crazy alien technology it has in it you can seriously hand hold a, a photograph of the moon like shoot the moon holding it without a tripod and get a decent shot like pretty close to the moon it's incredible that is impressive yeah I'm look that's really it, impressive it's you know like how a, much would a camera like that cost is what i want to know it's like a, it's i have a, no idea i know that astronomy is like people look at it as like the weird nerdy quiet dork habit but it's actually like takes a lot of like tenacity to sit outside at night alone all day slash night. Um, and it's really expensive. Like no one would think about how expensive a hobby it is. Like uh, how, like how many I mean, thousand, all, like this is like all a, hobbies you can go, you can go camera? overboard like, with, but, uh, yeah. you know, th this camera, and it's kind of why I've been interested in it, um, for that purpose of really just photographing the moon. But, uh, I think it's like in the $500 range. So okay, that's really that's, impressive. That's reasonable. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But just for shooting other things in the sky, like, you know, airplanes, like seeing the pilot pick his nose and stuff. It's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, yeah. I'd feel better knowing that my pilot was a human. No, maybe. <laughs> you you don't, yeah. you don't, I mean, it's just like restaurants. You don't want to know what really goes on in the kitchen. You probably don't want to know because you'd see him like sleeping or something. Like, it's yeah. better, better to not know. I already try not to think about the frightening level of automation in airplanes and how badly that breaks down with the human pilot in control. So, yeah. Yeah, I, human, I, I would inter frankly, interactions. I would Creepy. feel better if there were there were no pilot there. Just let the robots do it. Would you really? Because I every time I, I meet a pilot, would. I always ask Airbus or Boeing, "What do you prefer?" And I had a pilot once tell me, "Well, when you get into a Boeing, it says you're in control. How can I help you? And when you get into an Airbus, it says to you." I'm in control. Here's error, how you're going to help error. me. And then, like, I have never met a pilot ever that's like, I love flying Airbus. They're like, my airline is good to us and we fly Airbus. Or mm. I love Boeing. Like, it's actually kind of frightens me a little bit. Interesting. <laughs> I try not to think. I try not to think about it. Yeah. I, I weirdly have, like, a fascination with how human machine interactions break down with big technologies, um, with things like space, but also with airplanes. Well, yeah, it's on, creepy on, when you start to like those tiny little like the computer does something but doesn't tell the pilot what it's doing. The pilot corrects for human error, but then the computer makes it worse and then 500 people die. <laughs> on our next episode, we'll potentially have a, a pilot <laughs> um, as our guest on our next episode. So we can talk yeah. to him about his thoughts and or experiences with automation and flying. Yeah, yeah that would be interesting. No. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Back in the day when I was going to do a PhD, that was going to be one of the main topics of my PhD. And then I decided, fuck it. <laughs> good story. Yeah. Good story, what, Amy. Good ending. High five. What, what are your, what are your guys' thoughts on, on, um, driving and automation, the self-driving cars? You know, I was thinking of that when you started this conversation about the pilots and I don't know. I mean, I've never been in a car that functions that way. I, I figure it's inevitable and we can make the machines that can do it. It's just a little soon maybe, but there are cars out there now that are what they have. Uh, not, not necessarily full automation. I, I'm going to take you down the road, but I've heard of cr cruise controls that are set up to keep distance between the car in front of you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, full, fully, Fully automated uh, cars are, I mean, we're going to see a lot of them in, in 2017. Um, a lot of companies are testing them right now on the roads. And it's funny because Uber's got some, too, that are mostly uh, self-automated. Yeah. And they just got kicked out of California, basically. So they're all, eh, hey, we're going to Arizona. So yeah. they're, they're shipping them here to, to, to Arizona. So <laughs> Arizona, where whatever the fuck you want to do is fine. That's right. <laughs> Um, the thing that scares me most about the self-driving cars is that transitional period when like there are some self-driving cars, mostly like human driven cars and still a bunch of idiots in control of said human driven well, and that's cars. The thing. Like, yeah, the big, how are, the big how is element here work? is still the, the human equation. Like, 
Yeah. We all know how bad like, drivers are. Like, <laughs> if we could yeah, eliminate the, the human element from it completely, that'd be great. But yeah, you're still going to have Because then humans. you can have the car stock. Because it's like, again, to go back to like the analogy of airplanes, like airplanes have the, uh, it's called TCAS, the, I forget what it, Transportation Collision Avoidance System, I think is what it is. So like if two planes are in proximity, the two systems talk to each other and it commands one to go up and one to go down. So the planes agree. The problem is that the human pilot has to enact on that. So if different, um, in different countries, if they have different rules, like in the U S I know that they're trained to listen to TCAS in other countries, they're not. And that has caused midair collisions. So like in that transition period between like some self-driving cars and some not like who's, who's responsible for reacting to a situation like that? Because it's all going to come down to like people making the right choice by chance. So yeah. Yeah. Because part of driving is not just controlling the vehicle and making it do what you want it to do, but maybe anticipating what people around you are going to do. Like, oh, is yeah. that guy going to come into my lane? I better slow down. Yeah. And are, are we going to ask the, the computer to do that, to second guess everything around well, it? Well, I mean, they probably have as good of a chance as anybody driving in L.A. because you drive in L.A., you know that it's a crapshoot. Like, you have no idea. Yeah. Even if they're they're giving you signals. Like, if they've got their turn signal on... Uh, it's more likely than not that they're not really going that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They could be just like an old guy with the, you know, the, the continual left, just mm -hmm. like driving along. Yeah. No idea. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> driving in L.A., fun times, good times. <laughs> good times. Ooh. Yeah, and they're, they're talking yeah. now, too, about uh, with the automated cars, just their ability to, um, you know, take into account different driving conditions like weather weather related stuff and how different you have to drive um in different weather situations so it'll be interesting Which to see definitely things that people in both california and arizona having lived both of those places don't know how to deal with i have never seen more accidents than when i was living in phoenix when there was any kind of rain yep. it was like people didn't realize like oh yeah you can't actually go 85 down surface streets when it's raining yeah. although i still think my favorite like failure of weather was when i was living in durham for one winter and there was an inch of snow an inch of snow and there were cars on fire everywhere <sighs> Because nobody realized that, like, you can't just gun your engine to go up a slightly slippery hill. You have to go slower for traction. So everyone's car was overheating and just, like, on fire. It was, like, wow. overnight it became post-apocalyptic America in, like, wow. the south. It was very weird. Yeah. It's kind of like it is in, in Arizona during the summer when people are trying to get up to Flagstaff where it's slightly cooler. And, you know, they're stuck in traffic because everybody leaves at the same time on Friday evenings or whenever. And so they're they're stuck in stop and go traffic going up these hills and they're blasting their air conditioning and their old shitty cars and car overheats. Yeah, I think that's my least favorite part of the drive to Phoenix is that like, I don't know, 60 mile stretch on the 10 when it's like turn off air conditioning to avoid overheating next 80 miles. And I'm like, oh, this is just like this is the part of the drive where if my car breaks down, I'm actually going to die. Because no one's going to find my corpse. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's just like that sketchy, sketchy bit of raw desert out there. Well, that's always my yeah. thought driving through Nevada. Um, you know, through a lot of those just completely empty areas where there's nothing, mm -hmm. no civilization for miles and miles and miles. And not really cell service either. So, you know, you, you feel comfortable that you've got your phone, but uh, most of the time it says no service. And, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. I haven't seen a car for an hour. I don't have any cell service. Yeah. Not a One time I driving had... home from uh, Lake Havasu, where I'm from, or where I was born, uh, we came across a vehicle overturned that was, I don't know, probably 50 feet off the highway. And, oh, that looks weird because this the hazard lights were still blinking. Mm. So we stopped, and there was someone trapped in the car. And we still don't know what happened because uh, it, it took maybe 20, 30 minutes for the emergency vehicles to get there. And this isn't even as remote as these locations you guys are referring to. And this was on the, was it the 62 or the, the highway that you take to go from the 10 and go through Yucca Valley and Joshua Tree? It was yeah. out there past Joshua Tree and 29 Palms. And I, I hope they made it. I hope they got to him in time. But Yeah. Scary. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a great that's area remote. for sky watching. Yeah. yeah, just as long as your car is the right way up. That's right. That helps. Ideally. <laughs> Ideally. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, this got fun. This got weird. Um, it's supposed to get weird. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like the question that we need to ask you is, um, if you're if you were a sort of space fan and space nerd growing up, like, did you ever have thoughts of pursuing that as a vocation or no? I mean, I started taking some math and I really, I took physics one year and I really liked it, but I, Maybe it was the time in my life I wasn't uh, dedicated enough to studying and doing homework. If I went back and did it now, I'd probably do a lot better at calculus and stuff like that. Pursuing it? I don't know. I don't know. That might ruin it for me even. It's like I like working on cars too, but do I want to go into the business of being an auto mechanic? I don't know. It's like being, being in the band. I listen to music on my own time way less than I used to. Yeah. I used to, mm -hmm. I could never, you know, when I was younger, maybe 20 years ago, getting in the car, first thing you do is pick music and play it. And I'll find myself in the last 10 years or so getting in the car, not even turning on the radio. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't want it to ruin the hobby by, by getting into it. But then again, I see the people working on it and what they're working on. And I go to JPL and see them. I go, oh, I want to, I want to do this. I'm going to build that rover or because i'm into building stuff in that techie aspect and seeing the machine shop where they're you know making things out of billet aluminum and titanium and so all that. cool in there it's yeah. awesome yeah i love that stuff yeah so, so i guess maybe, i would do it if i had the right what you're saying is you've realized that the world needs to go back to a time when we had music like jeffrey's fan club so <laughs> just saying maybe yeah uh, it that was a good band. I had a lot of fun being in that band. Yeah. Um. Hmm. 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 How are we doing on now. beers, guys? Oh well. I have, played, I have at least. Much. I have like two refills left of my. <laughs> yeah, I still see. I still have another bottle next to me, and like I got nothing to do. <laughs> I don't think you guys are gonna finish your beer before we're done. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, that's your fault for always picking the small beers. I know, um, <laughs> I know. We're going to have to just make that a rule that we've got to do big beers I know. only. I, I know. know, it's got to be the big bottles from now on. Is that how you... Uh, that dictates the length of the show, yeah. One beer? Be oh, wow. Because, well, when, when the other, drink is over, we're out of time, like, yeah. Other, otherwise, we would just sit here for hours and hours and people would just get really bored with it. So the idea is to constrain it so that it's not horrible <laughs> for people who want to listen to this. Um, yeah. Because uh, I think we, yeah, when Jason and I sat down and did our first episode, it was like two and a half hours. That's I don't know who's gonna. I don't know who's gonna sit through that one. <laughs> I listen to podcasts you, that are about two hours, but I'm usually doing something else while I'm listening to it. Yeah, so exactly. I don't think of yeah. it as I'm trapped by the length of the podcast. It's just yeah. keeping me company while I do something. What are what, yeah, what are the I other podcasts you listen to? Oh, let's see. Related to what we're talking about, I do. Listen to Star Talk mm -hmm. once in a I while. I remember what I was going to ask you. I'm way behind on that. Oh, you want to ask me before we forget? I was going to ask you because you mentioned that you watched Cosmos, the Carl Sagan Cosmos growing up. I wanted to ask what your opinion was on the newest one if you watched it. Because everyone I've asked, <laughs> yes, that one. <laughs> okay, so you're a fan, I, I assume. Oh, yeah, it's um, fantastic. Huh. Most I love people? even more that one of the main people involved with it is Seth MacFarlane. That, you know, the guy that makes the cartoons that say dirty jokes. That's great. Yeah, yeah that is. That, guy, that guy's impressive between yeah. the, the family guy, his, his musical efforts, yeah. and then this, the Cosmos thing. That's great. And that's the greatest thing, too, when you discover that about somebody who you, you know, may already kind of admire. And then you find out they have this whole other side to them that's incredibly impressive. Yeah, when and I he's first heard that, I was all, Holy successful shit. and good at those other things, too. Yeah. Like, I could sit here and, look, I make cartoons. See? See that guy running? And that would be the extent of it. But to him, it's like next level. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to succeed in that many, you know, variety of things is less like, uh, he must be so really good. Hard. Yeah. Got to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, let's see. Podcasts. Podcasts. Sorry to derail you. I was just curious because no, no, everyone's I, got a everyone's got an opinion on the the Cosmos yeah. reboot. So I think it's great. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson is entertaining. 
fun to listen to. I, I think they tried to kind of follow the path of the original show as far as subject matter. Mm-hmm. But of course, they brought it up to date, I think, a little bit. The the cartoony segments, I bet that's something a lot of people have issue with. I right. Yeah, I was not a fan of the cartoony segments. I also... I felt like Neil deGrasse Tyson was trying to be Carl Sagan instead of just being Neil deGrasse Tyson. Mm-hmm. Cause like, I love Carl Sagan's quiet, like awe inspiring. Like he just, like he just gives you that sense of like, I'm a grown up, and this is still amazing. And it's so like quiet excitement that I love. And I'm like, this doesn't seem, this seems weird coming out of someone who's not Carl Sagan. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah. Yeah. But that in the cartoon segments were a little bit odd to me. Yeah. I guess they had reasons. I'm not sure what they were. I don't know. It got an entire generation back excited about space for eight weeks. So go team. <laughs> eight yes. weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't and it an eight week run? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And modern uh, graphics and computer animation and all that stuff sure looks a hell of a lot better than 19, what, what was it, 80 or early 80s when he, when he was doing yeah. that? Yeah. The <laughs> the graphic of him like walking across the calendar to like show when dinosaurs popped up in yeah. humanity. It's yeah. like this just, this is, it's like, it's so old at this point that it's like kitschy and yeah. fun. Yeah. But yeah, it's not good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like Radio Lab. Mm-hmm. So sorry, podcast. Mm-hmm. Radio Lab. Uh, as far as techie science stuff, that that's about it. Okay. On on the flip side, I listen to car stuff. Like there's one called The Smoking Tire. There's another one called Hooniverse. And it's just some guys that are basically automotive journalists so they get to test drive all this stuff and talk about their project cars and sometimes it's really interesting sometimes it's not you know i can't really relate to what a gallardo convertible is like to drive i don't think i'll ever drive one that's a lamborghini by the way okay gotcha (laughs) so Uh, what what do you do with cars uh, i try to do with cars yeah, that's I try to keep the right them, question. I try to keep them running, and I try not to sell them. So basically, I'm a car hoarder, I guess. Even though I'm, I'm only up to four, I it's just that I I have like I still have the one that I bought, uh, I, my, the first car I bought like the first year when I was in college, and I just don't want to let it go. Yeah, and that's the one that actually right now doesn't run, but that's that's next on my list. I'm. I'm almost three for four operational right now. In fact, I'm three for four drivable, but one of them isn't registered yet because I need to give some money to the DMV, unfortunately. <laughs> right. Yeah. So are there any of the uh, you know, current electric car companies or fewer future electric car companies that uh, you know, catch your eye or, or have your attention? Um, I'm a big Tesla fan. Oh um, yeah. But there's a, a new company, Lucid Motors, that's going to start uh, manufacturing in Arizona. I don't know about them. Um, I've just, just started seeing stuff about them pop up in the last couple of weeks. Um, and I think they did a road test like against uh, Tesla and some other cars. I didn't see the results of that. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to see. And I, I love competition. So I, I think that fuels a lot of this this development and innovation, mm-hmm. but man, I, I I love Tesla so much. And one of these days, I, I I will have a Tesla. I'm into the electric car thing, and you know, a lot of the stuff I have is old. Like a couple of cars from the '60s. One of them just now I put on fuel injection. So, uh, fuel economy is not something I really strive for because they're big V8s, and mm-hmm. I just don't drive them that much. So, but let's see. I grew up driving an old Volkswagen that, that my dad still has, and there are at least one or two companies that sell kits to convert those to all electric, and they're kind of expensive, and even Volkswagens themselves are getting kind of pricey these days because there aren't that many left compared to 20 years ago, but I'm talking about like old bugs. But to build one of those and convert it to electric, oh, that would be fun. Or just to convert anything to all electric, just, I wouldn't have the the what the range of a Tesla because I'm not going to buy $30,000 worth of lithium batteries or anything like that but yeah. just to be able to go to the, the store and back in an electric car that I built I want to do that someday too but that's a cool goal that's I, like awesome. that. I, I, yeah. I think I need an airplane hangar or a warehouse somewhere and that's not going to happen without me moving like into the sticks yeah kind of yeah. like where I live 
Yeah, my, my yeah. buddy who's a pilot, um, in one of the hangars next to where their their planes were housed, um, for whatever reason, somebody was housing a bunch of Teslas. And so he got to take out a Tesla on the runway and just like open it Whoa. up. Oh, that's got to be awesome. Yeah, no, um, unique experience for sure. Yeah, my my Muay Thai coach actually recently borrowed a like a friend of theirs Tesla because their car was in the shop and he he described it as like so he kicks me in the chest a lot with padding but he just like kicks me in the chest and sends me flying across the room he's like it feels like when you kick me in the chest the acceleration on those things because he just like went in like a quiet neighborhood he's like all right there's no one around straight away and just like floored it and he's like it's just it was like getting thrown back it is the acceleration amazing. Is instantaneous. Totally, I am you would dying. not expect it from an electric car. I'm not a car person. I don't care. As if a car gets me from point A to B without catching on fire, I'm really happy. <laughs> um, but I really want to try one of those like awesome electric cars and just see what that feels like. So I experienced, yeah. uh, my, my first experience with a Tesla was, was as a passenger in Las Vegas. And it was with this weird random couple that I didn't know. But... I was at the Star Trek convention and um, I was working the working the sounds um, like it's going to end well. (laughs) Yeah. Tell me more. I I was there as a guest and I was, I was working the table with my buddy Garrett, uh, Garrett Wong. He was on Star Trek Voyager. So I was at his table with him helping him sell stuff and some like fans or something, I guess. I think they were also coming to maybe help. I don't remember. I think they had previous contact with Garrett. But they show up, and they're these kind of weirdish, like, hippie-type people uh, from San Francisco. And they had apparently rented a Tesla from somebody. And so they showed up, and they're all, yeah, we've got a Tesla. You want to go for a ride? They were just, like, very weird about it. And it was all, okay, these people probably want to kill me, but I really want to ride in a Tesla. So, yes, let's do it. Good way to die. So, so yeah, going off with these weirdos who have, I have no idea who they are. So or, I'm drunk in a Tesla. Yeah, so. Does, does it have a, a latch on the inside so you can get out? No. No? Okay, well, you're still here, so but you, you're you smiling. You... I like that you say that with certainty because you know, too. <laughs> it, no, it, it, it was an amazing experience. Like, part being terrified and not knowing, like, who I was getting in the car with and where we were going, it was it kind of added to the fun. But they got on the freeway, and, you know, again, I'm glad they're dri- they were driving, and I wasn't because, you know, I'm a law-abiding citizen. So I certainly wouldn't have opened it up like they did. But they got on the, the freeway in Vegas and just, like, floored it. You know, so you could do that zero to 60 in four seconds or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think he was probably flying down the freeway to 100 or something. It was it was a thrill from the back seat, Absolutely. But, yeah, got home. I think he I actually asked if I wanted to drive. And I was like, nope, I'm good. Thanks. But That's the wonder of those electric motors. Yeah. 100% of the torque from the zero. Torque is amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. And it, yeah. it also is cool and futuristic like everything inside inside i mean the whole like center console is like a giant ipad or something so that's pretty cool too right for a lot of people yeah. are, are migrating towards that and yeah. then, you know they're not putting a lot of thought into the dashboard just like oh we'll put an ipad in the middle i mean <laughs> i like yeah, that but you I mean, know that's what, and i'm a, that's I'm a t- spacex's new spacecraft is like too i don't yeah. know if you've seen the the recent press conferences but it's just yep. like a glass panel that folds down with all the buttons on it and all i can think when i see that is what happens if you're floating around and you accidentally like whap it with your arm because like we all know that arms will activate touch screen so like you just activated all the release mechanisms, the jettisons, yep. everything in that thing because you designed a fucking glass cockpit for your I'm spacecraft. a techie, and I love, I love futurism. And you love SpaceX. I love all this stuff, and I love SpaceX, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I'm also a button lover. I love buttons. So, you know, I'm torn with that kind of stuff. And in, in Tesla and seeing how that stuff works, I love it. I love that display. It's so sleek and sexy and awesome. But at the same time, I'm a button guy. So, you know, and I see that. Like, what happens when that doesn't, like, activate or malfunctions? Like, all of your controls, like, all of it, it's gone. So. Yeah. Um, so my grandmother had one of those like old women chests of like tiny little drawers for different size color buttons. That's all I can think of when you say button lover is that you secretly <laughs> have a garage full of like tiny drawers with buttons. I do them. love grandma's button collection too, for sure. What is it with people like like old people and button collections? Like that was a thing in the 50s. You've always got to be prepared. I guess. 
I don't know. Um, what are your thoughts on SpaceX, Derek? I think it's really neat. Uh, this whole privatization of space has happened in my lifetime, and uh, it's exciting. I have no problem with it. Uh, and seeing that that uh, autonomous vehicle that will send the supplies up and then come back down and land on a barge, like it blows me away that that's that's the best way to do it, and yet it emulates some Buck Rogers movie from the beginning of when movies are being made. I mean, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I like SpaceX. Can't even say. It. Cheers. Fine, you're like halfway through a giant bottle of beer. You're allowed <laughs> to not be enunciating very well anymore. Yes. This is great. Maybe <laughs> that's it's the whole like, point. Uh, have you ever watched Drunk History? Yeah. Yes. I mean, I'm not. Yes far from drunk but it's reminding me of that the whole trying to talk about something and sound like yeah you're speaking clearly but you're not yep yeah it's pretty good that's like basically conferences in my world everybody (laughs) just gets really drunk and tries to like one-up each other with space nerdery until everybody's just like slurring neil armstrong's name everywhere it's pretty (laughs) awesome hey i get paid to do it 200 nights a year fantastic (laughs) so they say Mm mm-hmm so um, you weren't in Real Big Fish when when Tyler was the trumpet player, right? Tyler Jones? That was before your time? I got to play with him several times, filling, but filling in. Yeah, I wasn't a full-time member yet, but he was in the band when I was around. Yeah, okay. yeah. I remember him being quite sloshed quite regularly. But... Yeah, he usually had a, a bottle of Jack He would have a bottle of Jack, exactly. Within arm's <laughs> reach on stage at any given time, yeah. Good times. Cut. That seems like that would get really messy really fast. Sorry, I opened another beer here because we're still going, so why oh, not? That's good. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I don't... He, he was a funny guy, and he and he had fun on stage, I think. Uh, he's also not in the band anymore, so... Yep, that's right. I don't know. That's right. When did you join the band? Uh, that would be around June 2007. But the first time I played with them, it was probably more like 2001 or 2002. Hmm. 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 Yeah. 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 Hmm. And that also <laughs> explains your 10 years of not turning on the radio in the car. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> I definitely quit listening to Real Big Fish in my free time, that's for sure. Yeah, I bet. And Unless, hey, remember that song? We should play that the next tour. All right. And I'll listen to it a few times at home and try and remember how to play it. Yeah, it seems like a thing you'd have to do at some point. Like, I keep an instrument. Like, there it is. You can't see it, but it's right there. Thinking that, oh, maybe I'll practice more often if all I have to do is reach over and... There it is. <laughs> no. It doesn't happen. No? Yeah. It's not enough. Yeah. I just don't practice. So were you and the Knuckle Brothers? No. No? Okay. Just had to ask. I don't know why I thought that. Yeah. No. Nope. Walk us through your music history, then, since neither of us seem to really know the details. Oh, gosh. If you can remember. Or go <laughs> through the, the history to put, that you to remember. Put you, to put you very much on the spot. Or highlights. <laughs> no, I, I can remember. Uh, I guess. Let's see. I started playing with some some guys that were still in high school. And I, I was only like a year or two out of high school. And uh, so we played like talent shows at their their respective high schools. Mm-hmm. Those are probably some of my first performances in front of people playing bass. I was in kind of a rock band for two, two and a half years that did I learned a lot, collected some gear. Uh, I think in that whole stint with them, we played in front of people maybe f- six or seven times. And it was it was back when if you wanted to play at the Roxy, they would give you a brick of tickets and say, here, sell these yep. or sell these or no one will, will be there. So most of the shows were all friends and family. It wasn't until Jeffrey's fan club that I, I went to one of their shows to check it out before I was in. And there's a room full of people, two or three hundred kids, and they're not all friends and family. I know that for sure. These people just want to be here because they're into the music and this band's popular. And that's when I went, oh, I need to do this. 
I, I've been in the wrong place all this time. It's time to change. And that was probably 1997. And the rest, I think, Jason, I think you know. Checkers Fan Club, <laughs> Forces of Evil. Uh, I may have jammed here and there with some other people, but nothing ever came of it, really. Yeah. Uh, and then here I am. Yeah. Had you been into uh, Ska at all before Jeffrey's Fan Club? No. In fact, at, at that point, I didn't really go to see live bands play. I, I yeah. didn't know. It, it was kind of foreign to me. Maybe I was too focused on, like in high school, I was in the marching band. And so that was my music for me, was being in that and... And then outside of school, we were always working on cars, or I'd go drag racing with my dad on the weekends, and uh, that's what I did. So when uh, when the JFC thing came up, it was actually my sister who was friends with the drummer, and said, "Oh, listen to this tape. Uh, they might need you to play bass for them because." Their bass player is having a kid, and his wife says he can't be in the band, yada, yada, yada. You know, classic story. And, oh, ska music. And I was scratching my head. Doesn't that have horns in it? That's about all I knew. And it's amazing that that's where I came from. And, and now look at where I'm at. So you, like you, you, you're the bass player who, like, replaces guys who have kids? <laughs> oh, yeah. I guess I am. That's so weird. Hmm. Uh, that would make a great business card. <laughs> yeah just Derek the bass player who replaces guys who have kids no other say, explanation if you're I in a band little... and you play bass don't have a kid because Derek's coming for you I should take <laughs> a picture of me wearing like a ninja outfit and in one hand I've got a condom and the other hand a sewing needle <laughs> like hiding outside of people's homes uh, that's perfect perfect, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll yep. that one for later mm-hmm yeah, that would be like the caricature of yourself as a really good Halloween costume. That's what that would be. Oh, boy. I would be explaining that constantly. <laughs> what are you? Be uh, super meta and weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you play? <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's weird. <laughs> Especially with that sound. Just like, yeah, that makes it yeah, way less lot. creepy. Way creepier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. All right, well, yeah. I mean, I guess everybody's got to get their, like, start into an industry somehow. So, yeah, you know how you got into it. <laughs> yeah. There's nowhere to go from there. <laughs> yeah, we did kind of head to dead end, didn't we? That's yeah. all right, because, you oh, know, no. I mean, the show has run its course, because unlike you people with your giant beers making me feel inadequate here, my, my yeah, beer's by gone, the way, so. This Acoustic Ales Brewing Experiment Strawberry Fields beer is Fucking phenomenal. It's a win? Um, All right. Oh my god, this is so good. I'm I'm amazed that it's this delicious and tastes like strawberries and um isn't gross. You'd like it because you hate IPAs, Jason, and it's yeah. very like it's a sour, but it's not like like a gross sour. It's like a nice tart sour. Nice. I like yeah. those. Yeah, there's a, a brewery like a that's uh, that's in um well they started uh in, in Boise, Idaho and Bend, Oregon called Ten Barrel Brewing. I think we've talked about them before, but uh, they were my, they were my favorite favorite brewery in Boise, and they've since expanded and they've got uh, I think they're in Denver now and they're opening a, a brew pub in uh, San Diego, um, but they do a lot of experimentation, a lot of weird beers, and they always have a sour or two, and they they do a um, a raspberry crush, which is you know raspberry but not not really sweet at all, just kind of a, a hint of raspberry and and tart and nice and sour mm -hmm. so. I dig those a lot. Nice. I'm still trying to find a taste for those sour beers. I'll try them for the experience, and it, you know, people around me are drinking them. And, woo. Some are really nasty. Some are so, really sour, and it's yeah. like you know, all I can think of is like I don't know if you watch The Simpsons, but the one where with the the lemon tree. Is it the lemon tree? And Homer like bites into it and like his entire face like puckers <laughs> into itself. Like that's what yes. I feel like when I drink that. I'm just like, this is just like, like I just licked a lemon and I'm not having fun with it. But if it's tart instead of sour, it's kind of a nice like happy fresh medium as opposed to like, like, no, it's the, it's the super sour gummy. That's the one. There you when go. It's the sourest gummy in the world. Yeah, Cause that's then right. it's the, the Venus gummy Venus de Milo. Because I found out recently that you can buy gummy Venus de Milo patches, and I want to get one and sew it onto the butt of one of my jeans because it'd be really funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, beer uh, is so weird yeah. and complex, and, and sours are so strange. Um, I mean, but we talked about IPAs, too. Like, you know, I, I do like some IPAs, but they're so, there's so much variety there and so much strangeness that goes on that you just have to, like, keep drinking them all because they're yeah. all different. And, and uh, you know, there's, there's one there that you'll find that you'll like. But, yeah, all sours are different, and I've had so many sours. Like, I get excited when I'm at a place and they actually have a sour. I'm like, yes, I'll have your sour. And then it's just complete ass. <laughs> and you're yeah. like, oh, disappointment. I, I have yeah. one once. I, I even was at their brewery. So the last thing you want to do is have them here, drink this. And then you're at their brewery and you're going, this mm. sucks. Yeah. But I guess you could say, oh, I don't know if this is for me. Because really, does the beer suck or do you just not like it? Right. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. And like I thought yeah. it tasted like dirty socks. Not that I eat dirty socks. <laughs> you get any ideas? You have some experience in dirty socks. Okay. But people around me were like, oh, this is so good. Yeah. Well, you can have mine then because... You know, this is stuff. totally random, but your dirty socks comment reminded me about... What is it? Is it... I, I think it's cilantro. Like, people say that cilantro is, is something that is so, like, polarizing with people. And there, there are so many people. You either like either it or you, you love don't it like or you it. Hate it. And the people who hate it, like, a lot of people, apparently, to them, it tastes like dirty socks. No way. Yeah. I love cilantro, but I know, I do, I know people who hate it. Yeah. Wow. My best friend is oh, like that. I'm growing it right now. I've got a, like a plant this big. Nice. Yeah. It's nice. so bizarre to me that, you know, taste can be that different, but. Yep. Humans are weird. Yeah. And I always, I always feel terrible too when somebody like, I go through and I'm like, here's the kind of beer that I want. And then they give me a beer and I'm like, this kind of just tastes like hot garbage. Yeah. <laughs> can I try something different? I had to do that last night and I felt really bad. I was out in this. I like asked the guy, I was like, I'll just have the same. And he gave me something different. I'm like, this isn't even palatable to me. And I don't even know yeah. what it is that like, I will drink pretty much any beer. I'm not super fussy, but like, this just tastes like, I don't know, like, like cardboard that's off. Wow. I don't know. Yeah. It was very My odd. My Julie is the same way. She'll try them and she'll, sometimes she'll say she likes the smell and then she'll have a sip and it takes two or three seconds and then, oh, there it is, and it's that's it. Doesn't want it. Done. The, the yeah. only one she's liked is the Dogfish Head 120 minute, hmm. and but that's yeah, super boozy. What is that like? 15 percent alcohol or I've something? I've never so, tried that one. You should seek it I out. Keep, and try it. Yeah. Yeah, I keep I, they, uh, the the beer store across the street from my house has an awesome rotating selection. They always have the 90 minute IPA, but they've never had the 120 minute IPA. They don't make it near as often, and. Yeah. To ship it from there all the way here. I, I've had it on tap in San Diego before, which blows me away, and in Las Vegas. Hmm. So it really? happens. You just have to be in the right place at the right time. I know what happens. Back when I was living in Phoenix, um, and this is the weird thing to say on the internet, but like I'm dating an alcoholic, um, he started brewing and like hunting down beer. And there was one pub one night that had one keg of the 100 minute, 120 minute IPA, and we didn't get there in time, unfortunately. Hmm. It was the only time I've ever like had a chance to see it or to, to try it on tap, and I couldn't, couldn't get there in time. Aww. Yeah, I've never tried it. Good stuff. Yeah. Also, Pete wants to come say hi, apparently. He's super that's needy not, right now. Him, you've ignored him long enough. <laughs> I've ignored he, him for an hour and a half. And he's, he's getting the cat vibes. Just the he's internet. getting the cat vibes. Yep. Yeah, uh, pretty much. Yeah, there's a litter box in here. and uh, <laughs> th This is probably their nap time. I could go grab one and bring him in here. How many cats do you have? Just two. Want me to go grab it? Yes. I yes. Wrap yes. up the, you know, yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. There. And we this are, means we can hit on a uh, pause. Yep. Yeah, we're we're bringing in our other Fantastic. element of the show. This is perfect. Uh, yeah. This is good. I love. I just love. I just realized that like because we have this narrow shot for the video when we do three people that like all you can see is like Pete's neck and me just stroking his head. Yeah. Uh, Pete. Oh, this isn't gonna work. No. no. They're sleeping. How old, how old are your cats? Oh. I know when they're like older and you can't really move them. Pete's Pete's not even quite four, so he's pretty malleable and wakes up and stuff. Four and a half. Oh. Yeah, we adopted them. And, they, and yeah. they won't they won't let you move them. I mean But you're I, bigger than them. I could uh, I could try, <laughs> but okay, he's gonna be really bummed. Let's see what happens. Maybe it'll be a good experiment. Uh, I love that we just probably you're, you're gonna hear him protesting probably from the next room. Fantastic. That's good. I, I, I like cat conversation. Yep. 
Um, also, I feel like I should just point out because we have a second here. This just came off of Pete. <laughs> oh no, Pete! What are you doing? I'm like, I'm like Come trying. On. It's, it's. I have not turned the heat on in my apartment yet this year. Yeah. I don't think I've turned turned the heat on since the, my first winter in L.A. But it's apparently just warm enough that like he's oh, shedding like look. mad. Oh, Hi, kid, kitty. kitty. Slightly angry kitten. Meow. You gonna talk to us? He was just talking to me, but it wasn't nice. <laughs> What's his name? Digby? This is Digby. Digby. Oh look my at God. Look at how he's my techie cat. He, Oh yeah, you want to get down? This sucks, huh? <laughs> why? Why have I done this to you? You're a good right? sport. You're All a right. good sport. You're out of here. Oh yeah, that was an angry meow right there. <laughs> he always does that when uh-huh. it's not. How, how old were they when you adopted them? Uh, uh, was it three months? Three weeks? I think it was three months. Three months. Yeah, exactly. it's definitely like with cats because I got Pete when he was I brought him home when he was five weeks old. So he's gotten really used to me just like making him do stuff like sit with me and, and follow what I want to do. So he doesn't protest. He's just sort of like he just goes limp. Yeah, when they were little, they would both sit on my lap and like be up here tapping on the keyboard and stuff and hanging out. And now it's just like, no, dude, I'm over it. <laughs> Aw. <laughs> Uh, it's sad when kids grow up. <laughs> yep. There's Digby oh, and his brother that's hanging cute. out. Love it. Oh my god. Are they actually brothers? Yeah. Oh, do they snuggle? Yeah. They awesome. do actually. It's hard to believe. One minute they're chasing each other, uh, and then and fighting a little bit, and then the next minute, all you hear is licking. It's just a ball of two brothers licking each other. That's adorable. Yeah, I've got two, two, two small dogs. They're Maltese, so they're white, fluffy balls of nothing, and uh, they're they're more a cat than dog, and they're like that. They're they're brothers, and they're fifteen now, um, mm-hmm. but they hate each other, but they're best friends. It's funny to see that that just depending on what time, like they either hate each other or they love each other. I feel like I don't have any siblings, but I feel like that's how you describe siblings. They mm-hmm. hate each other, but they're best friends. Yeah, that's right. I can yeah. see that. I can see that. I mean, I have right. two sisters. I don't hate them. So, if they well, you, you, usually yeah. the hate thing happens yeah. when uh, yeah, when you're younger your and you're like <laughs> yeah. in the same house and growing up together. There's that. Yeah, that's different. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Well, you're missing out, Amy. The only child. You missed out. It's weird. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm the oldest. Eh. So. Mm, old one. I don't. I dislike the oldest. Not really, but I, had a, I was I had always a cousin jealous that, that I treat, wasn't the treated oldest. Treated me like the little brother he never had. That was weird. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got only child, oldest, and you must be something else. I'm I'm second Amazing. oldest out of out of five. Of, five of how five, many? Five boys. Oh. Five boys. So you're in the middle somewhere. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In my, the nebulous middle region. Yeah, yeah. My 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 brother, uh, older brother is, uh, I think, three years older than I am, and uh, then five years below me starts a like a year span between the three youngers. Nice. Yep. Five five boys in a house. Uh, you know, all at the same time. It was kind of insanity, but we we survived. Five boys. Wow. A lot. Yeah, My parents a lot wanted boys. a daughter, and I don't blame them, but uh, never happened, so they, they called it quits. Smart choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They'd ended up with 12 boys. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. Yes. That's how yeah. it works. Apparently. That, that sounds insane, but kind of fun. How many mm. broken bones were there in your house per year? You know, as crazy and insane as they all are um it's surprising that it didn't happen that often um, pretty good i mean kids are also basically made of rubber like yeah. they break and then they kind of like bounce back yeah which is so weird your bones are really brittle till you are like super uh what's the opposite of brittle Pli- pliable yeah. pliable until you're like 12 yeah so i i think there were yeah. there were it was more the case that things got broken and not not bones or anything with the body like just a lot of destruction. Destruction and mayhem. <laughs> Sounds about right. Yep. Yeah. 
Oh, we are so off topic right now, huh? If anyone was listening, they're definitely not listening now. <laughs> you know, we've got something for everybody. So, you know, I don't know. Yeah, but this is this is the whole point. It's like when when do you ever in life with anybody sit down and have a beer and then have like a focused conversation on one topic that doesn't just like go off rails and like onto weird topics? That's right. So for all of you who joined in because we told you that today's topic <laughs> was astronomy. Hi. We and we probably like like drew you in with with mention of real big fish, and then we talked about none of that and a lot about space nerdery. <laughs> yeah, I feel like uh, you stuck with it. <laughs> we really didn't stay on topic too well, but oh well. That's kind no, of our goal. No, there was like a good yeah. No, there was a good like forty five minutes on astronomy and astrophotography, and then like then you just become humans who drink, and then it's way more fun for everyone. So that's right. the goal. The yeah. goal is just fun. The goal right. is just like so... yeah, hanging out. Let's conclude this show, and Derek, I'll just ask you one more thing, and that is if somebody were to have an interest in astronomy and want to get into astrophotography, um, what advice might you have for an entry into astrophotography? I think Astronomy Magazine is really good because they have uh, basic star charts, they have a section on astrophotography, they review the gear, they have updates on what's going on as far as exploration and all the science that's going on. Yeah, I don't work for them. I pay for my <laughs> subscription, but it's it's close. I'm a little behind on reading the uh, issues for some reason. Like, like I said, this year has been a weird year as far as astronomy goes, but I think that's a good place. Awesome. And maybe and the uh, other question. Oh. Oh, sorry, maybe find uh, a star party near you, or if, if you poke around, you might find that there's a group of people that come out to a public area and just set up their telescopes. Like, yeah. I've been to Griffith Observatory, and out in the, like, the grassy area between the parking lot and the building, they'll just set up scopes, and you can just look through them. Yeah, that's really cool. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I feel like the the other question, th thank you, uh, the other question that we usually ask people um, at the end of the show is if you could go to any body in our solar system, um, where would you want to go and why? Well, is this uh, not thinking about how safe it would be to go? Or yeah, survive? yeah, don't. So, so like you're going to survive out the radiation. Yeah. You have all the food, all the life support you could need. This is purely because this is a place that you want to visit for whatever reason. Space magic. Yeah, space magic. Hashtag think, space magic. I think I would pick one of the, the moons that are either around Jupiter or Saturn that are most likely where we're going to find some kind of life elsewhere than here. I'd probably pick Titan. That's, uh, what's that, out around Saturn? So I want to see an ocean made of methane, liquid methane. Have you heard about the rain and what it's like on Titan? So No, actually, now that I think about it. Because, because of the density or the, the way the liquid is, the, the liquid methane, if you can even imagine what that is. All I can, when I think of methane, I just think of, whoa, what was that? Right? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, digressed. They say between the gravity and the atmosphere and the, meth the liquid methane that the raindrops would be, you know, like marbles or, or large snowflakes. And they would, I'm sorry, the snowflake comparison, they would fall at the same rate as a snowflake falls here. So imagine a giant raindrop that floats down like a snowflake. That sounds like some crazy sci-fi movie, right? Yeah, and it's that's, happening. that's yeah. the Matrix happening. all slowed down, yeah. Yeah. That's that's awesome. I never thought about rain, methane and ethane rain on Titan, but yeah. Yep. We're no, big, both Gates and we're I have big said Titan fans here. We're both big Titan fans. Good. Partially, have you ever read The Sirens of Titan? Kurt Vonnegut? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd I'd recommend it. Uh sci-fi, but sci-fi that also will like punch you in the chest at the end of it. It's brilliant did you write this book? and it's Did I write this book? No, I wrote. Uh, <laughs> I wrote this book. You, said, you, said, you <laughs> um, mentioned chest punching or kicking. I yep. figured. Okay. <laughs> no, Sirens of Titan is Kurt Vonnegut, and it's it's one of those. Uh, I don't know if you're a Vonnegut fan at all, but like Sirens of Titan is one of the reasons that I like. I don't know. I was 20. Like I was very much already a fan of Titan. Then I read that book, and it sort of like solidified my obsession with this moon. <laughs> even though it's not about Titan, it's about like 
finding your place in the universe because it's Vonnegut and everything he does is steeped in allegory and then like kills you right at the end because he's such a good writer. Um, but yeah, Sirens of Titan. I'd always tell people to read that book. Uh, I'll add that to my to-do yeah. list. Thanks, guys. Yeah. I have not read that either, Amy. I w- you I will should read that. that. It's I will such read that. a good book. Yeah. I think the last uh, science-y, space book I read was uh, Rare Earth. So it's a couple guys, I think they teach at a university in the Northwest, and they went over all the, oh, we're making this podcast so much longer now, aren't we? We're back on topic. But they went over all the things that they feel had to happen for Earth to be like it is. Hmm. And they're, they're trying to add, add uh, t- points to the argument that there are so many billions of planets, some of them have to have life like ours. They're trying to say, but look at all the things that had to happen here for it to be like it is. What if we are really, really rare? Hmm. Hmm. I like the hmm books. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Hmm books. Yeah. Hmm books. Your book's a good hmm book, Amy. But uh, thank you. Less, yeah. Less, I, I mean, for for different reasons, not on a philo- philosophical level. But. Not a lot of fil- not not a lot of philosophy. More Nazi history. Yep. Because who doesn't love some good Nazi history? That's right. <laughs> Everybody loves some good Nazi history. Um. Yeah. Wrap All up right. our show, Amy. Let's wrap this up. All right. So where, I mean, Derek, you're a fairly private person on the internet, but if people want to find out more about what you're doing and follow your activities, where can they find you on the internet? I guess you can find me on Instagram. What? What is my name on there? I guess it's just my name. All right. That, that won't be that hard. Or you can, uh, <laughs> you know, you search for Real Big Fish and I'm probably tagged in a bunch of the photos. You're you're pretty findable on the internet. Um, I, think I, Jason, my, I think it's Derek Chase Gibbs. I think I use my whole name. I think it is actually. Yeah, because I yeah, we'll, we'll make sure to to track it down and we'll put, uh, we'll, we'll put, we'll some put links it on the screen somewhere. so people can see it. And... It's the same on Twitter, even though I don't really tweet. Yeah. If I do, it's probably a, a beer check in from my Untapped app. So oh, that's that's important too. Yeah, yeah. everything's right. better with beer. Sure. <laughs> Uh, Jason, where can we find more about you and then UFOs by extension? Uh, well, Twitter is good for me. I'm at acentric. That's A C E C E N T R I C. Also, a website where you can find this show and other content, rogueplanet.tv. All right. And you can find more of me, all of my space things. Uh, on Twitter, I am AST Vintage Space, my YouTube channel, Vintage Space. Uh, just Google it and you'll find me. Um, and if you are watching this podcast on my main ch- or my uh, my second channel, rather, which is just Amy Shira title, you don't need to find that. Um, but I'll have links to all of these things in the description below. Um, Derek, thank you so much for having a very large beer and chatting with us about like all the nerdery stuff, because like the nerdery is the fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah, cheers to nerdery. I've had um, a good time. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Cheers.